Hello everyone, please make your way to the main room for those who can hear us outside. <laughs> welcome uh, and welcome to Privacy Camp 2023. <laughs> um, yay! This is the 11th edition and I'm really glad to see you in person again after two years of editions online. Uh, but we're also really pleased to make the content of today available online for those who are watching us. So um, it's a double event and we're really happy about that. I'm Claire Fernandez. I'm the executive director of EDRI, European Digital Rights. Um, EDRI is one of the co-organizers of Privacy Camp together with the Free Universität Brussels. Uh, the Law, Science, Technology and Society Research Group, uh, Privacy Salon, the Institute of European Studies at the University of St. Louis. So thank you um, to our partners. Um, I will just make a few announcements now about Privacy Camp, about the content of today's discussions, then uh, acknowledging the people who are behind the event, and then um, some few logistical announcements. So for those of you who don't know uh, what Privacy Camp is, um, this is the uh, Brussels activist conference gathering civil society, academia, um, industry and decision makers, including EU officials to strategize and learn about human rights and privacy in the digital age. Um, Privacy Camp is meant to be a free, accessible conference pre-CPDP. Unfortunately, now since the pandemic, CPDP has been moved to May. But we hope that in the future we manage to gather the two events again together. Um, but as technology is becoming a more and more important part of our lives, um, and that our relations to technology has evolved, so has Privacy Camp. So I'm really pleased to see um, old friends, as well as newcomers, people from human rights organizations, from social justice and climate justice groups as well. So just could I have a quick show of hands as to who is attending Privacy Camp for the first time? <laughs> yeah, quite a few new people. And how about um, those who've attended already Privacy Camps online or... Okay, thank you. That's quite interesting to see as well the evolution of this uh, beautiful conference. Um, today's topic is a reflection of the gloominess um, of the storm of crises that we are facing on so many fronts. The war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, the cost of living crisis, the climate crisis, but also the, the, far, the, the, the rise of the far right. So we wanted to explore today how we think about technology in this context. Um, is technology fostering, amplifying um, these crises? Um, should we rethink our relation to internet and access to internet as a common good? And these are uh, some questions that we hope this community can continue to address together. We hope um, this community can continue to question the power abuses, the exploitation, the oppressions that are at the core of this crisis. Um, and that collectively we can also imagine technology that works for all uh, and reclaim our rights, uh, our democracy and our planet. So I really look forward to some very interesting conversations, whether on the intersection of digital rights and the climate crisis, whether rethinking uh, internet platforms, uh, surveillance technology and how it impacts people on the move, uh, but also police surveillance and thinking about abolitionist frameworks. Um, so I really hope you enjoy today's content. Um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the people who are behind and the organization who are behind this event. First of all, um, our general partner for the sixth consecutive year, the European Data Protection Supervisor, um, who will join later, I think. So thank you very much to Wojciech Wieverowski and his team for trusting us with this event, for hosting their Civil Society Summit within Privacy Camp. Uh, so really much looking forward to a discussion on spyware and state hacking after lunch. Um, but Privacy Camp also exists thanks to the support of um, and the many uh, donors to EDRI. So individual donations also really make a difference and I invite you, uh, if you can, to also contribute today so we can continue delivering a free conference. 
Um, this particular edition of Privacy Camp is also made possible uh, thanks to the support of um, the Climate Justice and Digital Rights Coalition of Funders, uh, North VPN, Epic, Vivaldi, Quant, um, the Mysterium Network, and the Tech Hive Advisory. So thank you very much to our sponsor. I wanted um, to already have a round of applause for the content committee. Um, I don't know if they are all here. I know Rocco isn't yet, unfortunately. Uh, but we wanted to thank the content committee for reviewing your very interesting sessions. So Andrea Bellu from Edri, who is there. <laughs> Gloria Gonzalez from the VUB. <laughs> and uh, Rocco Bellanova from the University of St. Louis. Thank you very much as well to our Guillermo Perez from Edri and uh, Angie Noni who have put together this event and it's a lot of work. So I want to appreciate them. <laughs> and the, the whole Edri team for um, leading sessions and organizing uh, today's event. So speaking of organization, some few logistical Announcement before we can start, you would have seen that there are three rooms. Um, this one, the Salle des Arches and the Boudoir, um, you will follow the sign there, uh, it's uh, on the ground floor. And those two rooms are streamed and the Salon is just below us, is the workshop room and this one is not streamed, it's meant to be an interactive session. Um, the opening is just now and the closing will also happen here. So please don't forget to come back at the end if you're still here. Um, each session will have an Edry colleague. Um, so they will be here to, to liaise with the tech people. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to approach them. They have Edry t-shirts or other uh, t-shirts, which I leave you discover. Um, there will be limited spaces for workshops. So... Uh, yeah, just to remember that if you really want to attend the workshops to make your way there um, as soon as possible. Um, if you are taking pictures, uh, remember to only take pictures of the people with the green lanyard and not people with the red ones. If you have accessibility needs throughout the day, please uh, contact Guillermo Perez from the, from the Edri team. And that's it, we're gonna uh, start now. Uh, and run until approximately 11, where we have the coffee break. Then there are, another, there are other rounds of sessions for about an hour and 20 minutes, and then lunch. Lunch will be in the foyer where we ju you just had coffee. Um, and after lunch, we have two rounds of sessions again, and we will finish here at uh, five. Um, so I really hope you enjoy today, you enjoy the rich content. If you are online, that you can really um, yeah, listen in and, and, and uh, follow all of our conversations. And if you are here, that you also enjoy the breaks, we're meeting people again in person and talking. Um, so announcing that here just right now will be the discussion on reinventing platforms um, that will be led by Valentina Pavel. We have the rise of border tech, so AI and uh, migration in the boudoir and the workshop on Europol um, in the Salon. So we will have people introducing these sessions in the respective rooms. Thank you very much. I hope you really enjoy today. Uh, welcome to the session on reimagining platform ecosystems. This session will be a hybrid session and will be moderated by Valentina Pavel. Uh, she's a legal researcher as at Ada Lovelace Institute, and I immediately give you the floor. Hello, everyone. Good to see you here. Uh, thanks for choosing this session. Um, we're uh, going to talk about reimagining platform ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> and um, I, I have some little surprises in for you today, uh, but let's uh, let's get started on some uh, some context and, and housekeeping and logistics first. Um, so uh, 
I'm a legal researcher at the Ada Lovelace uh, Institute. We are an independent research institute based in London and in Brussels. And our mission is to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. And in November, we published a report called Rethinking Data and Rebalancing Digital Power that looks at four interventions across uh, infrastructure, institutions, governance, and uh, public participation. Uh, that can help us uh, think more ambitiously about our digital ecosystem and uh, transform how platforms work towards the needs of people and society instead of uh, them serving uh, corporate agendas. And one of these interventions is uh, interoperability uh, as a way to transform how platforms work. And um, I, uh, today, it's, it's very good to uh, open this discussion together with you and our panelists and think more critically about what would a new vision for platforms look like um, and what would it mean for, for uh, online platforms to work for us? Uh, what would we like to see when it comes to, uh, to digital systems? Um, and uh, one of the ways we can think more critically about this is to introduce uh, interoperability mandates that can uh, introduce a higher degree of modularity and customization uh, in platforms, for example, replacing different uh, third-party algorithms. Uh, but we're going to delve uh, more into that in, in a second. Um, in terms of housekeeping, as you know, this, this session is being recorded and streamed. Um, we have a hybrid panel, and this is my first hybrid panel, so I'm uh, counting on your tolerance if there are technical glitches, and uh, I want your support in case things get um, sidetracked a little bit. Um, so we have um, two of our speakers in the room, two of our speakers uh, online. Uh, but I know there's also very great expertise in the room, and I'd like to invite your questions and comments very early in, in the discussion. If you're on social media, please tweet with the hashtag privacycamp23 and uh, hashtag rethinkingdata. And if you have questions, please uh, do use these, uh, these hashtags. Um, I, I'm going to ask my colleague Connor, but maybe he's not yet in the room uh, to help me monitor social media. But if not, I'll, I'll find another, uh, another vol volunteer. Um, and I do have one provocation for you. Uh, we're in January, and January usually is the time when we look forward, when we make predictions, when, you, when we think about the future. So uh, just as a way to warm up those uh, hashtags, I'd like to invite you to type in your predictions for 2023 in terms of where do you see platforms this year, uh, given, given the fact that uh, the DMA and the DSA are going to, to come uh, into application. Um, and where would you like them to be in five, 10 years from now? What changes would you like to see? So as you're typing in your answers, I'm going to introduce our panelists and then ask them to, to also uh, share their predictions and their uh, wishes and hopes for, for digital platforms. Uh, so we have uh, Ian Brown, uh, computer scientist and uh, internet regulation expert with us in the room. We have uh, Victorio Bertola, uh, Head of uh, um, Policy and Innovation and open, at OpenXNet. Uh, we have uh, Chantal Yoris, um, Legal Officer at Article 19. And Jon von Trechner, uh, CEO and, and Founder at uh, Vivaldi. And I'm ex extremely grateful to have you all here, uh, especially because some of you are um, with uh, big time zone differences uh, behind of us. So I'm, I'm really grateful to all of you. Um, and just to uh, up the games in terms of using those hashtags and you posting on social media, preferably on Mastodon, 
uh, you can tag me, uh, Edri, and uh, Ada Lovelace um, on Mastodon. Um, you, you'll find us very easily. Uh, or on Twitter. Twitter is still still a thing, unfortunately, but uh, we'll accept. We'll accept. And I have some um, some uh, little incentives for you to do that those tweets. So this this is uh, an Ada Lovelace mug, and it says, "What would Ed Ada say?" So what would Ada say about platform regulation this year and in five years from now? And the, th the three most interesting uh, uh, predictions are going to, to win three mugs. Uh, and I need a judge for that. Does anybody want to volunteer to be a judge and monitor Mastodon and, and Twitter to offer these presents? Because I, I don't want to be a judge. I did study law, but yeah, I'm more of an activist, to be honest. I'm going to volunteer you if, if you're not going to raise your hand. Uh, and I'm going to volunteer the, the person who has uh, their phone ringing, because obviously, <laughs> obviously they are very well connected to social media. <laughs> so you're going to decide who gets the, the three uh, coffee mugs. OK, so uh, Please do type in your answers. You have until the end of the session to that. We'll announce the, the winners at the end. And now, uh, Ian, and would you like to share with us what's your, what's your vision for platform ecosystems? Uh, where do you think interoperability fits in? And what would be some of the advantages and disadvantages that you see? With your, with your sort of theme of revolutionary change, which I like, because I spend most of my time thinking about incremental change, um, I think we're already seeing a lot of interesting incremental change, and, and we'll hopefully get a, le a lot more of it via interoperability mandates in the DMA. Next year, I mean, it, it, it comes into force, I mean, it's in force, but it, the, the gatekeepers will be designated uh, in the summer. I think it's September the commissioner has to do that by, and then those gate gatekeepers will have to um, follow the obligations in the DMA by next, by next March, March 2024. And then there's an even further stage with the interoperability obligation. Other companies that want to connect to it will almost certainly be WhatsApp and iMessage, and perhaps some of the other big messaging platforms have to request it, and then the gatekeepers have three months. So I hope later next year, a very concrete hope, I can delete WhatsApp finally. Um, I deleted Facebook years and years ago and never regretted that, but of course one of the arguments for an interoperability um, obligation is it's very hard if all your friends and family and colleagues and school kids teachers and community groups and so on have um, lots of discussions on one platform which really you need to be on you know if you want to have a social life if you want to know when your kids school is closed tomorrow because of snow a whole, a whole variety of reasons so that's my very concrete hope I hope we'll see a lot more innovation in platform businesses generally. And again, other bits of the DMA have, you know, it's not just the messaging interoperability obligation, which got, which got a lot of the media coverage. There, there's stuff relating to operating systems, app stores, search engines, and so on. Um, and I hope that will make, you know, we have examples like DuckDuckGo and um, Signal, more privacy focus platforms. They still have very, they still have a very small market share overall. Um, and I hope the DMA will help them to significantly increase in quality and, and user numbers. So that's the evolution. On the, on the revolution side, um, one thing I, I really liked in, in the report that um, Valentina and, and colleagues did with Ada last year was platforms tend to be monolithic today. Um, sometimes they'll let you plug in components as Facebook and, and as Twitter do, that serve the interests of those platforms. But of course, there's always the risk, as we just saw with Twitter last week. I mean, here, here's another quick question. Who was using Tweetbot or Twitterific or one of the third party um, clients to read Twitter rather than Twitter's own uh, platform? And sadly, we no longer are because Elon Musk decided last week he was no, he was no longer going to allow alternative Twitter clients to connect 
um, to connect to Twitter. So we're all thrown back onto the main um, Twitter platform. That's the risk of interoperability of complementary services if the platform itself always gets to decide, well, which of these services do I want to allow to connect or not? Of course, they're not going to allow services to connect that they think threaten their, their business. That's what, that's what Musk has said, and that's where I think regulation is important. But um, imagine, um, imagine platforms which went much further than that, which technically speaking, it would be more complex, but it would be possible that you could decompose platforms into lots of different bits of functionality and plug in alternative um, stuff of your choice. Um, the one which Article 19, which I'll leave Chantal to talk about, has been working on, I think is a really interesting idea of changing the recommendation and curation algorithms in um, social media platforms. But you could imagine all sorts of other ways uh, to give people a lot more choice about how platforms worked. Um, to let to give opportunities to SMEs to come up with new innovative functionality that a, a big platform might not um, think was so interesting. So I'm I'm still as passionate about interoperability as, as I was when I started researching it in 2008. I've been <laughs> I've been pushing for it ever since, and it's wonderful. It's in the DMA, and I hope it will go a lot further. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Ian has a, a very great contribution in our Rethinking Data and Rebalancing Digital Power Report. So I, I do recommend you, you read that because it, it goes into the practical implementations of interoperability mandates. Uh, but Chantal, I also want to uh, come to you um, and uh, ask you to share us uh, your vision for, for platforms. Um, and yeah, what are your your predictions, what's coming up next? Thank you, Valentina, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, so I, I work for Article 19, and we're an international freedom of expression organization. So that is basically the lens through which we view um, interoperability um, and, and uh, platforms uh, more generally. Um, first of all, I, I do agree, uh, basically, with, with all the excellent points that were made by Ian. And uh, from a freedom of expression perspective, more specifically, um, of course, uh, we, we would wish the internet was this open um, space for, for debate, exchange of ideas, uh, where users can, can connect and, and express themselves um, freely. And, and of course, we understand as well that uh, today this, is, this really is not the case. Um, it might uh, seem unrestricted, but a, a few a handful of of dominant uh, companies and platforms really have a lot of power over, over the internet at the infrastructure level, but also when it comes more specifically to like uh, social media companies. And they have an enormous amount of power over uh, the, the information we get to access and the ways we can, we can express ourselves. And so our vision really is also, we know as well that the, the business models that have been adopted by many of the dominant players are not exactly conducive uh, to a healthy debate, uh, the way the recommender systems work. And I will, I will talk about that aspect um, in a, bit, uh, a, a bit later on. But the way these recommender systems work, they, they tend to amplify uh, the content that tends to engage users more, which leads to dissemination and amplification of harmful content of this information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in that sense, uh, we think that uh, the, our vision is basically that the internet goes back and these private companies, as you mentioned at the start, uh, Valentina, uh, also that they work again uh, for users and enabling users um, to, to again express themselves and participate in, in public debate. And we think that the, the solutions generally that we've proposed at Article 19 are, are twofold. One is of course, the, the sort of more traditional focus on human rights, due diligence, um, transparency of platforms, procedural rights, etc., which are more aspects that we've talked about in the context of the DSA, the Digital Services Act. And then as well, we think um, that, the, that the companies, which are gatekeepers also in the sense of our enjoyment of human rights, that their, their market power needs to be needs to be curbed um, because otherwise there, there will not be enough incentive for new players to come in 
and for users to make a choice which service they want to use without, as Ian mentioned, losing all their all their contacts. Um, because, for instance, they want to leave Facebook because they think their respect for privacy it doesn't live up to the standards. Uh, I, today, if I if I want to if I want to make a choice to leave Facebook, I le I lose all my contacts essentially, right? So we do think it can bring in new players that may have an incentive to focus more on uh, reputational risk around human rights or how they respect uh, the right to privacy, the right to freedom of expression. Um, so also in terms of prediction, we now obviously have the the DSA and the DMA. Um, both of them, uh, we think, are a step in the right direction. They might not have been as ambitious in in certain way as we would have wanted them to see, but but for sure, the, the fact that interoperability now has become part of the DMA and that these human rights considerations have become part of the discussion of the competition discussion and the discussions in the DMA um, are positive. Um, also, when it comes, I mean, we really. As a matter of principle or, or generally, we, we basically only see upsides from introducing more and more interoperability. Of course, um, if this is introduced, it needs to come with um, with relevant protections to privacy, security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we don't see any downside per se of making the platforms as interoperable as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chantal. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, Jan, can I can I turn next to you? Sure. Oh. So um, I think uh, where I'm coming from is a, a little bit of a different uh, place. Um, I've been on the internet for a really long time uh, since 1992, building two browser companies, and now on my second one, and and I'm kind of pissed off about the idea that. Uh, companies are getting away with uh, basically being spyware and collecting information uh, about what we are doing. And and in my humble opinion, the first step that we need to go to is to basically ban this, um, that uh, this level of collection of data shouldn't be allowed. And, and I'm not saying you can't use any data whatsoever, um, but I do think it's really important that we, we, we stop this misuse of data, the profiling of users and the utilizing of that profiling to, to place content. So instead of giving people a choice of algorithms uh, to, to show content, I want to, to basically ban this way of selecting content. Uh, and in particular ban uh, the profiling. I think the damage to society is significant and I don't really think technically speaking, there is a simple way to do this. Uh, I mean, reading the report, there's a lot of details in your report about all the things that need to be done to deal with the fact that you have data. Uh, in my humble opinion, it's a lot simpler to just take data out of the equation. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not excited about kind of new ways of doing things. And I hope everyone will be moving over to the more open standards. There's a new open standard with the activity pub. Uh, which enables you to write uh, new uh, technical solutions to which are distributed. Uh, but just to be clear, solutions like Mastodon and the like that are built on top of that, they're not, data is not part of the equation there. So the idea of forcing data to be part of that equation, I think is, is not a good thing. Uh, you still have the ability to move from one platform to another. Uh, and, and I think that's a really good thing. And I think it's good that that's being a focus that you're able to move between platforms. I'm just afraid of cementing the, the rights of big tech to be collecting our data and that we just normalize it instead of saying it's wrong, that we say, okay, we have to live with it. And I, I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. I think we are seeing the consequences of what they've been doing. I think they should never have been allowed to do that in the first place. I think they should have had the ethics to stop doing it as soon as they understood that what they were doing was wrong. And I think obviously, I think all of them realized that. Uh, so we need to change there. Um, and I think fixing the kind of issue that we have with, uh, with data collection and privacy and the like, it needs to be done that way. So, so from the one side, basically banning the use of, of, of profiling and data for the display of data and ads and, and, and the like. And the other hand, I, I think 
anyone should be embracing those new standards because suddenly we actually have something that's standardized, uh, which is uh, where we have a, the W3C behind it. So the World Wide Web Consortium, which is kind of the, the guys that gave us the web, uh, obviously starting with Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, that's what we should be supporting. That should we, do. and that's by the way that we've we as the first browser company and and others coming after us uh, have jumped in and are putting up our own servers and and again trying to explain how all of this all of this works. All the institutions, companies, foundations, and the like should be putting up their own servers and engaging in that. And I think there's an opportunity now in particular with the focus of the misuse and the focus of what's happening on Twitter for this to take off. And I think we all should be supporting that. And that's actually maybe one of the faster ways to see a change. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for bringing those concerns in. And uh, Vittorio, uh, let us know if uh, there's any way we can address some of the points uh, that, that Jan uh, mentioned and if interoperability does uh, does help or does more harm with that? Yeah, no, I, the, of course, interoperability helps. So, I mean, I, I start from the question of what are the platforms going to do tomorrow? And I think they're going to do the, the same thing that they've been trying to do every day, so they conquer the world. So it, this is really a mission for conquering the entire knowledge of the world and closing it down and using it to build more wall gardens. And so the, this is the stake. I mean, many people, especially outside of technology, do, do not really understand what's at stake. So now this is endangering really the democracy and the basics of our, of our society. And, and so they are going to build more world gardens and try to resist opening up the, these ones. They will resist the implementation of the DMA. They will resist any additional laws. So we'll send lobbyists everywhere to all the capitals and all the offices here. And they, they will try to basically make all this talk of uh, digital sovereignty, sovereign cloud uh, moot by just uh, giving uh, very good offers to all public administrations in Europe so that they use Office 365 or Google Suite or whatever. So they, they, they have tactics that, that, that are both based on the, in, on the legal side, but also on the business side. And also on the technical side, usually they try to use the global standardization uh, bodies to, to push certain technologies that suit their the way. And I, I have a word of caution about, about encryption, which is good and we all like it and we've been pushing for it. But now they're trying to build this kind of encrypted overlay network so that you have a, a phone on you or something, you have a vocal assistant in your home, and this just opens up an encrypted channel to a server in the US and escapes any European law and any control, you don't even know what, which data are being sent from your home to the servers somewhere in the cloud. So they actually they are using encryption to disempower the users. So, the, the, so in the end, the, 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 the point is rather, rather <coughs> what's the alternative? So interoperability is important because it is one of the key elements of any alternative that we want to, to build I mean, to oppose this. Actually, it, it was the original principle of the internet. So if you, if you look at how the internet was designed in, in the last century now, I mean, until the end of the 20th century, it was based on interoperability. And the services that came out of that phase, like email or the web, were interoperable services. And we actually are still today. They, they, I mean, in a way, even if they are trying to be dominated by the usual suspects, they are still the most open ones, the ones in which you can actually choose different providers and you can actually use third party applications to send messages or, or, or connect to web pages all over the world without having to go through the platform. And so we are not really trying to propose anything new with interoperability. It's really being just keeping the promise of the internet, which was that uh, even if you were not in California, not in Europe, not in China, but in, I mean, somewhere in Latin America or, or in Africa or in Vietnam, I mean, you could just download the specifications and learn how to write the code and build something that would work all over the internet without having to ask for permission to anyone, to any government, but also to any company. So the sad thing that, 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 I mean, that we are now in the middle of is that uh, we discovered that, I mean, we, we defended the global borderless unregulated nature of the internet from governmental intervention. And then we discovered that if you go too far in that direction, there are no laws and there will be a, a few private companies that will just take over the internet and close it down. So we don't want the governments to close down the internet, but we also don't want big global companies to close down the internet. We have to find the, the good middle ground. And I think this will be the discussion for the next few years. Where do you set this middle ground so that you have some laws, some regulation, but not too much that, uh, that goes in the opposite direction?
thank you, thank you, Victoria. Uh, so you heard um, a range of perspectives. Uh, so I, I want to incentivize you bringing in the, the first question to the panelists with uh, giving you an ADA sticker. Mm -hmm. So whoever raises their, their hand first are going to, to receive stickers. Um, and if you're not ready for that yet, uh, I do have a set of questions for all our panelists. Um, for for Jan, um, for Ian, in, if if we think from a competition perspective, um, how can we uh, enable this new type of uh, of infrastructure with interoperability and and change and rebalance market dynamics? Uh, what would this mean for for users? What would how would it look like in in its most desirable form? And I also want to, you to touch on this point about um, something that was mentioned in the European Data Protection Supervisor's uh, opinion, uh, which said that um, the, the provisions on interoperability in the Digital Markets Act uh, are, uh, actually have the potential to advance uh, GDPR goals. And we've also heard um, Jan being less optimistic about uh, privacy and data protection. Uh, so how, how do we put everything in balance and how do we negotiate this? In terms of what um, legal provisions, legal obligations for interoperability look like, we've, we've got a number of examples, concrete examples now. We have the, we have the DMA in its final form. There was a lot of negotiation um, that led to the exact language about messaging inter interoperability obligations. It's a real shame that the European Parliament's version of the DMA, which also had a social media um, interoperability obligation, didn't get past the European Council, so that's not in the final version, but I, I, think, I, I think there are still ways over time that might be addressed. But there's legislation in the US uh, Congress that would impose very similar obligations. If you want to look it up, it's called the Access Act. Um, it it ha didn't, obviously did not pass yet. Um, whether the Democrat, now that the Republicans are, are in charge of the House of Representatives, I imagine there won't be a lot of change for the next couple of years, but we will, we will see after that. Actually, China has done a lot on interoperability obligations. You, you're, you're, I'm sure you're aware that uh, you know, we, have GAF, we have GAFAM dominating the world largely outside China. In, inside China, there are Chinese equivalents, massive platforms that don't, even, even more to an extent than GAFAM do elsewhere, um, like Alibaba and Tencent, and the Chinese government is, um, first of all, put pressure on those companies to open up their services to, to a larger degree than they had before. Um, but China is also changing its anti-monopoly law and putting new um, consumer protection provisions in place to require interoperability. So in terms of you know, what does a law look like to require interoperability, we've, we've, got, a, we've got a number of um, of examples. In terms of what the European Data Protection Supervisor's opinion has said, I mean, that's always been one of my motivations as well in, in um, advocating for interoperability obligations, because the hope is that, um, and, and by the way, just to make clear, I'm not saying this can replace the GDPR and strong privacy laws. It can complement it, I think. If you give people more choice and people care about privacy, which as we know from lots of surveys over the years, um, many people do. Um, if you give them the ability to pick Signal, not WhatsApp, to pick DuckDuckGo, not Google, you know, privacy-focused uh, services, freedom of expression-focused services, as, Sh as Chantel was talking about, that's one way to um, adv advance rights. I'm, I'm personally not excited by interoperability because of you know, commercial factors. It's, it's always been that that, um, that I've found most interesting. And that is what the, ED the EDPS said in their opinion. Um, I agree with it. There was some criticism last year when the when the uh, EU institutions announced they had reached political agreement on the DMA, including interoperability. Um, they weren't clear about exactly what they meant, which I think was a mistake because then there was a lot of speculation uh, online about exactly what does this mean and, and actually will it damage privacy and security. I don't think it does. I think the DMA has got it right in the way it sets out detail, very detailed provisions in Article 7 on those 
uh, on those aspects. But I think that, um, and this is something I've heard Vittorio talk about as well and very much agree with, you, yes, keep thinking about the impacts of, on privacy of data flowing between organizations with explicit user consent, but also keep in mind this other factor. Well, if you're giving people more genuine choice over the services they use, that means you're enabling people that value privacy to actually switch service and hopefully generate more market pressure alongside strong GDPR enforcement um, to do that. Uh, thank you, Ian. And, uh, Chantal, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, if we go beyond the, the Digital Markets Act and we think about uh, interoperability measures uh, that would allow us, uh, for example, to replace uh, different core functionalities like news feeds, uh, content moderation, um, what, what would be the implications from a freedom of uh, expression point of view? Because on the one hand side, uh, we can say that uh, this offers more, more choice and it's, uh, it's better for, for the individual user, but at the same time, we also have concerns when it comes to uh, entrenching the, the position of, uh, of large platforms as in the indispensable uh, infrastructure. So, um, w w where, do we, where do we situate this uh, from your point of view? Yes. Um, so first of all, I need to give a, a quick shout out to my colleague Isa, who is the, the competition expert in our team and has been working a lot on this, on our policy on interoperability um, when it comes to these core functionalities of, of the platforms. Um, so yeah, so for, for Article 19, we have been pushing as part of, again, our, our free freedom of expression advocacy generally and, and on our work on platform regulation. Um, that, that these uh, core functionalities should be opened up. So um, we categorically think that this will be positive uh, for freedom of expression. Um, so because the vast majority, as, as we have it now, obviously the social media platforms that provide the hosting services also in the same bundle provide the curation uh, services as well as the content moderation. Everything is done by the same player generally. Um, and we do believe that if dominant platforms would have to allow for third parties to come in and for instance to pro provide alternative content curation to users um, then th these users could have obviously again a more active choice in what sort of content they access and in that sense a much more active um, exercise of their right to information right and uh, we do think it will be beneficial from a freedom of expression perspective in in many ways. So um, I, I think if we give, so I agree with Jan on that point, if we give users the choice to and, and level the playing field a little bit between the users and the companies, because the users can leave if they don't like what the companies have to offer, we can incentivize these private players to go in directions that regulators basically have failed to do. So for instance, when it comes to the, the collection of the of a vast amount of personal data, the profiling and, and other harmful practices. So where regulators uh, have, have not managed to impose certain conditions that would be more beneficial for human rights, we think that perhaps through more user choice and, and through more empowerment of users, that can be forced in different ways uh, upon companies. Um, so uh, on, on the one hand, um, we've talked a lot about how recommended systems, again, can have uh, harmful effects, how they are designed many times, harmful effects on the public debate. Um, if users are given a choice and if um, different companies have to compete to be able to provide these curation services to users, then it will incentivize them to provide better quality, right? And better quality can also mean, again, um, better respect for human rights, uh, less privacy invasive um, ways um, of, of, of collecting data, profiling users, and, and for instance, access to a wider variety of sources. These are all things that we know that uh, many users uh, wish to have, but they don't really have viable alternatives uh, at the minute. Um, at the same time, we think it can be, uh, so we see obviously uh, around the world, many governments won't see a problem with the dominance of certain companies. 
and how they can uh, promote and amplify harmful content. But their remedy has been to regulate them in a manner that uh, restricts uh, user speech and in fact gives them more control to check what users should say or should not say online. So we are categorically against such repressive regulatory solutions. And we do think that um, uh, regulatory solutions based more on interoperability, open markets, et cetera, et cetera, can provide maybe an alternative um, to more repressive answers that we've seen from government. Hopefully, basically keep, uh, have governments opt for these type of measures if they work and refrain from um, adopting more repressive uh, answers to, to the same problem, basically. Um, and, and so we think that this can work for content curation services, for content moderation services as well. Certain people might have different levels of tolerance and which is uh, fair enough. Uh, and so they, they might wanna have a choice of what sort of content they get exposed to without that being imposed on all users in the same way. So again, we do think um, diversifying the environment and, and also there are many ways if we have new players coming in, there are also many ways these will be innovative new actors, which maybe we can't imagine right now as well. So we, we think there's just like a whole host of possibilities of how we will be able to interact um, online, engage online, uh, participate in, in public discussions, etc. So we really think that um, that, th that this will be uh, fully positive, as I mentioned at the start. And uh, to the point uh, where you said that it might uh, further consolidate power because they will be seen, certain companies will be seen as ne providing the necessary infrastructures for new players to come in. I mean, uh, the, the way it is now, they, they don't provide only the necessary infrastructure, they are the only uh, alternative without any other option of any other player to use this infrastructure and their user base to provide um, a different recommender system, different content moderation tools. So, you know, um, the, the more we can also diversify on the infrastructure level, and maybe some player will come in that, that will become even more uh, powerful outside the pure content curation service, the better. But we do think um, it, it will not consolidate further the power of, of the dominant platforms. It will, it will definitely be a first step in the right direction. Uh, thank you, Chantal. Uh, Jan, if I can uh, turn to you um, and ask you to maybe reflect on some of the points that, that were mentioned by, by Chantal and, and others and ask you, um, how do you see interoperability potentially being exploited by large platforms and uh, what measures do we need to think about in order to avoid further dependencies on big tech? And I, I did hear your, your point loud and clear on um, banning uh, ad tech and uh, looking at the data level and, and trying to, to figure out measures for data collection. But um, it'd be great to, to hear your reflections. Yeah, I, I think there's a number of points here. And I, I think, uh, I mean, for me, it's obviously the elephant in the room is the dealing with data. And I, and I think in a way uh, we need to address that and that needs to be a core thing. And I think everything else becomes a lot easier in other ways. But even when you have open systems, you still have problems. And I can tell you about that. Anyone that's, for example, trying to provide an email service um, and, and we provide free email to our users as an example, you'll run into systems where the big players will actually block you. Now they will block you for a reason because you're actually having um, issues with, uh, with spammers and the like. So spammers try to utilize the different platforms. But in the case of the big platforms, they'll just block, the, block you fully, right? So there's an interoperability thing, but then there's, they have a reason to block you because there are spammers on your platform. So they block the whole platform that you have instead of blocking um, just the spammers. So there's things like that. Now, when it comes to consent, uh, there's a lot of talk kind of that this is just a question of individual kind of decisions on what people want to do. But the reality, we know that, and we have seen that before that consent doesn't work. Uh, basically, people are not really actively given choice. 
they don't understand obviously uh, kind of what they're consenting to but also there's just a question to me what kind of uh, things are you supposed to be allowed to ask people for and I just think that it's gone quite too far. And we've seen that with GDPR and the like. Where, I mean, where we are seeing the pop-ups asking, uh, can we utilize your data? And there's a huge difference between how the data might be used, but uh, the dialogues may be very similar. So there's, there's a problem there. I just don't think that it works um, to, to be asking uh, users those questions at, at, at all. Uh, I, I think... Uh, in reality, they find ways to get around making it a real question. And uh, I also just think that people don't necessarily have the knowledge to understand what they're being asked. And they think about it from a personal point of view and they think, hey, I don't really have too much to, to hide. Uh, and then they accept, okay, to get access to the platform, I'll just do uh, accept it. So I, I think we need to change that. Now, as I said, I, I'm very excited about the, uh, the the new technical solutions like with the Activity Pub and, and the Mastodon and the like. And I would urge everyone to get on onto those platforms because I think that can provide uh, a catalyst for change. And I think obviously um, the DMA and, and the Digital Services Act and the like, all of those can help with competition. And I think that's a that's a positive thing. I mean, uh, I'm seeing the Digital Markets Act as something that can make a significant difference. But we just have to remember, uh, the big guys have a lot of different ways to create issues. They can create incompatibilities. And, and again, I mean, given that I've been doing this for a really long time, I can probably describe a hundred different ways that they've made to, to get around issues where they block competition in one different way or another. So again, there's the concern that even if you're okay, you can choose your own algorithm, but you end up choosing the default one. It's kind of like any of you noticed with the, the Microsoft, I mean, they're, they're not maybe getting there fully, but Kind of, if you try to download a different browser into the Windows operating system, how many different ways do they try to persuade you not to do that or block it? Or you can just do it like Apple does and not allow it in the first place or with Windows 10S and you don't allow it either. So th there's a lot of different ways to get around any kind of interoperability or choice mechanisms, which is why for simplicity's sake and, and not to have a situation where we put regulation in place and then kind of it doesn't really work and then we need to do it again and again and at the same time potentially cementing uh, the position of the big guys because we are seeing that okay they're they're in the position they are so we can't do anything about it so we, we kind of end up doing things around the edges. I think we have to go a lot further uh, and actually and a lot shorter in some ways because it's a lot simpler what I'm proposing which is kind of coming from the computer world it's the kiss keep it simple. Uh, and, and I think that's basically what we need. We need to see that there is a clear regulation what we can do. I, I think the interoperability aspects that we are seeing with technical solutions like Mastodon and the like is very exciting because you can switch between uh, servers and the like. But I, I also think it's, it's not enough in itself. You also need to deal with the elephant in the room, which is the data collection. And I don't think we should mandate kind of data collection and, and and kind of more people have access to it because I don't really think that will solve solution. We need to deal with those things separately. If we, if we deal with the data collection, ban it, uh, the misuse of data, and at the same time, we look at ways to, to, to be able to switch services and the like, I think then we are talking about solutions that will work. Uh, thank you, but I, I do have a, a follow-up question for both uh, you and Vittorio and basically everybody that's technical in the room. Um, if we operate with open standards, doesn't that mean that when a new player introduces open standards uh, that potentially perform better than, you know, existing, uh, better than how current services are, are running, doesn't that create a sort of a, a race to the top in terms of uh, new services replacing the old and bad ones and users actually moving towards uh, those services. Uh, is this uh, is this happening, Vittorio? Is this a myth or? 
Well, in, in, in general, the, well, the, the, the creation of new standards takes quite some time. I mean, the, the technology around the standards and the protocols changes relatively slowly. What, what happens is that they evolve. And so this is why the interoperability clauses are designed so that you have a common layer of common functionalities and then you have ways to extend them, which could actually be I mean, unilateral by specific services. And, and, and this could actually create this race to the top. But in general, what you do, I mean, by mandating people to talk to each other is that you actually create competition. So, I mean, I'm, I'm clearly the business guy because I have a jacket, but, you know, I'm, I'm actually an engineer. And, and by, my employer actually is an open source uh, software maker. Uh, we, we make some of the applications for email and DNS that are in any Linux distribution. So, so and I'm making this point because I, I do want to stress that, that this, this, all this talk is not against the businesses, it's not destroying the economy. You know, I, I was two months ago in a conference in Berlin organized by the Adenauer Foundation and there were politicians by a certain German, German party saying that GDPR is the worst thing that ever happened to Europe because it's a stifling business and it's okay. And, and I raised my hand and said it, it's the exact opposite. I mean, for, for the European internet industry today, if there is one competitive advantage against the Americans, it's the GDPR. It's the fact that you can tell the people that if you store your data in Europe and you use our services, they will definitely be more private and less privacy intruding than the American or the Chinese ones. And so, they'll, I mean, they, and, and so this is why I think that this is a step forward even for, for businesses. Because today, if you want to create, let's say, let's talk about instant messaging since this is where the interoperability is first coming in, into deployment. So if, you, if today you want to create a, a new instant messaging app, uh, well, good luck. I mean, yes, you can create it. Maybe it's much better than WhatsApp and whatever, but no one will use it because we already have like 10 different instant messaging apps and we don't want to install the 11th. And even if you do install the 11th, so you, you as, a, as the maker, convince people to install the 11th, then there's no one they can talk with because all the users are on the other side. So if you change this so that all the apps can talk to each other, at least for the basic functionalities, what happens is that, I mean, the user can actually install this new app and immediately use it to talk with all their previous uh, friends and, and contacts. And so there, there's actually some use for this app. And if the app is better, actually can start gaining market shares. and. Uh, and become used, and maybe all the others will see you that you're using it, and they will move to, to that app as well. So this is creating opportunities for competition and, and for business. But at the same time, it's also giving users a choice, and this is very important. So if if the user is dissatisfied with, with WhatsApp, they can actually move to something else without losing all their contacts and conversations and whatever. You know, there, there was a, a study when, when a couple of years ago, yeah, sorry, WhatsApp changed their terms and conditions. There were people that really wanted to stop using WhatsApp because they were, I mean, the new conditions were worse. And the, the, the survey said that uh, over 100 people that, that tried, only 1% in the end managed to completely move away from WhatsApp and uninstall it. I mean, some, I mean, like one fourth actually installed the new apps, but still kept WhatsApp for the old conversations. And most people just gave up and didn't change, even if they really did not want to use WhatsApp anymore. So th this is actually the effect we are, we're also giving for you. And there's more of that. I mean, why do we have to have 10 applications that do the same thing? And I mean, the only difference is usually the, the, the color of the buttons. I mean, this is consuming resources. It, it does have a, an environmental impact on, I mean, through cons consuming your battery and whatever. I mean, we don't need to, to I mean, to waste resources to, to have bigger phones and, uh, because you need to keep them messaging apps at the, operating at the same time. I don't know if, I mean, we, we should discuss also about the, the, the myth that the big tech is, push, is pushing that this is going to be against the privacy and security because, I mean, you, you have this very secure uh, WhatsApp uh, application that is not letting your data be accessed by anyone except uh, Meta. But uh, uh, that, so if you bring other, other applications in the loop, there will be other companies that can spy upon you and... I mean, this is really not true. I mean, it's like uh, like for email. If you don't don't trust the applications, the system that the other person you want to talk with is using, just don't send the communications. I mean, there, there, are, there are way. And, but in the end, uh, all the standards today are made so that we, I mean, what what happens with browsers? You you have browsers, you have web servers, and they negotiate the good level of encryption, the best level of encryption that, that they can give you, and this is automatical, and, and and you don't have to do anything, and it doesn't mean that uh, all the traffic is not encrypted. So that, that there are solutions for this as well. Yeah, but just to, to complement, uh, just complement the, the question earlier, if we look today at instant messaging apps, they all run on the same encryption protocol, right? The, so signal, signal came in at what point with the signal protocol, and then everybody adopted it. It was a pressure 
uh, from the user side for them to adopt the protocol, correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the signal is a sort of ambiguous position interoper on interoperability, but I understand them because they say, <coughs> yes, we, in principle, we, ag we agree we would like to interoperate, but at the same time, we are worried that if we interoperate with other apps that are not as secure as we are, then our users might lose some security. But the, pro the point is that if you establish a standard for privacy and security that you have to meet to connect, then everybody will get at least that minimum level. So, I mean, you, you, can, <coughs> you can be ensured that that, that that will happen. And so, of course, it's, it, there are also, you know, commercial positioning and or market positioning by all the various apps. So if, if you have built all your credibility on saying, I mean, correctly, we are more secure and private than all the other apps, I mean, then you cannot admit that all the other apps will be uh, using your same encryption. And whatever. But at the same time, uh, the, I think it's uh, in the end, th for users, it's an advantage to be able to choose because they will, I mean, if someone comes up with something better, you will just be able to switch finally to something that, that is more privacy friendly, even if just maybe because they have the servers in, in your country and not somewhere in the world in other places which have less privacy protection. Thanks, Victoria. Oh, yeah, great, great. I can. I can share stickers now. <laughs> Yay! Who was who was first? Sorry, I I I can't see very well because of the light. But uh, uh, we have a mic here, so let me let me let me pass this forward. It's not on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, the part you mentioned about there being like a lot of different apps, a result of that is, for example, um, apps like if this, then that, you know, um, uh, that connect different apps. And they more like sort of arose from the idea of just being annoyed that, um, uh, sharing data between apps is difficult, but not really the idea of uh, privacy. Um, and a lot of people look at uh, the, the operating system to fulfill that uh, purpose. Like, why does if this and that exist if Apple could, you know, connect those apps in the OS? And I'm wondering how much of the discussion or the problem should be solved by the operating system of uh, yeah basically that was it is this a question for somebody in particular on the panel or whoever nope. wants to take it whoever wants to take it I, I could I could try um, yes op often you can solve some of these issues at the at the OS level um, the DMA does include specific interoperability obligations for operating systems as, as well so for example and, and this was one of the this was one of the examples that Commissioner Vestea used when she launched the original proposal for the DMA that um, if you have an iPhone you'll know you can you can, uh, or Android you can um, use it to pay at terminals with your, if you put your card details. On the iPhone, Apple has specific hardware in the phone to, to ca carry out that transaction, which Apple doesn't allow any of its competitors to access. So all of all other final, financial institutions that want to let their customers use Apple Pay have to go through Apple, basically have to go through Apple Pay. And the, the DMA says, no, when you're in a position like Apple, where you control the hardware and the operating system, um, and you're doing things with it for, you know, using your own software, you will also have to allow your competitors. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I and most people are not using Apple's financial services. They've got a, a partnership with Goldman Sachs, um, but they're not a big bank, obviously, currently. I mean, they could be, perhaps. Um, but why can't I use my bank's app? without having to go through Apple Pay. I mean, I, I'm, I'm generally an Apple fan. I like, I like, generally speaking, their attitude to privacy, not so much their attitude to competition and, um, and interoperability. But yes, you can, you can do some of this through OSs, through alternative clients. So, I mean, uh, Chantal and Isis, um, one of the things Article 19 was doing was saying in the Digital Services Act, 
people, users of very large online platforms should explicitly have an option to use a different recommendation or curation algorithm on Facebook and so on. That's one way of achieving this. A, a parallel way is more along the lines that, that you're talking about. It's using alternative clients, like I mentioned earlier, Tweetbot or Twitterific and so on, to view your social media feed, because the client can, can apply the different algorithms to the, the prioritizing of the, the post and so on. Um, so I think a lot of these mechanisms are, are complementary. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, just I have a question on the because we are you were talking about the signal and I think one of the things that I remember that the people from Signal were saying is that they were against um, the idea of decentralized servers because they thought that it was impossible to to basically deploy the kind of security that they were that they were providing, you know, in that way. So something that I, would, I thought would be, if you can maybe open up a bit, like the difference between interoperability as we see it, decentralization and federa federation, because I think that there are all these things that we can, we get them bundled up a bit, you know, and, and where our, the fourth alternative, which I think is something that's been, you know, the elephant in the room, which is like simply break them up, you know, and just like go on a straight, you know, Anti, you know, like monopoly, just start breaking them and separate the vertical integration. Thank you. That's a great question. Any takers? Because I'm not going to nominate if not. <laughs> no, well, I, I agree. I think we, we actually have to, to have that discussion and. Uh, uh, in, in part, it is a philosophical discussion. So, of course, if, if I just stay alone in my room, then no one will actually have a, a way to communicate with me, but that will be um, very secure and private. So, that there's, uh, I'm not convinced that, that uh, I mean, people that say that we, they are the only people that can provide a secure service, I, I tend to disagree. I mean, I think that there are good public practice for security, and if the standard is done good, that, that will be uh, that will apl apply to everyone. Then, uh, I mean, of, of course, it's a matter of choice, but uh, interoperability is what enables mm -hmm. federation and decentralization, decentralization. But again, users are not forced to take it. If you don't want to inter interact with anyone else, you just, I mean, you can have your own, but by the way, by, uh, by having open standards, what you can do, you can have private deployments. So you can, you can take the, the, let's say, the global uh, instant messaging standard, if that will ever happen, and then uh, you can install your own uh, your server that you only use with your friends, and, and you are the only ones that can communicate through it. And uh, I mean, that, that happens with Matrix, for example, and, uh, and it's another way if you want to have additional security. How is that answer? Are you do do, do you want some um, complimentary remarks from Ian or somebody else? Just one, very briefly. I would say, um, I mean, I absolutely agree with Vittorio. I, I greatly admire I greatly admire Signal. You know, as a, an organisation and as a product, they're not the only organisation in the world that can run highly secure messaging servers. Clearly, um, and. Uh, I don't have any particular problems with Signal's privacy policies as such, that's why I, that's why I use them, but um, they are subject to US jurisdiction, which, which you know, potentially puts all sorts of surveillance obligations on them. The product is designed in a way to minimize the data that Signal as an organization can find out about you, but that, you know, that's, it's not zero, and we, we may not know now because the US government can place secret obligations on um, companies under US jurisdiction to uh, share information with the, with the US government. So I would like the choice with Signal actually to have my messages hosted in a European server, not in a, not in a US server. Thank you. There's the person online that wanted to say something. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to add from my side, if you don't mind, uh, when it comes to the web and, and understanding kind of how the web works, I think it's a great example of how things work when you have uh, underlying standards. I mean, in reality, you can, you can, in, in technically speaking, you can connect any browser uh, to, to any site on the internet. Now, obviously, from a competitive point of view, you will find that uh, uh, competitors try to, to block things and particularly when they're um, in a position of power. So this is where the Digital Markets Act come in and, and the like. But technically speaking, if there's a will, there's a way to, to open up uh, for interoperability in this way uh, for, for uh, messaging services. There's no question about that. 
Yeah, Thank okay. You. So uh, Joris van Hoboek, I'm at the University of Amsterdam and uh, the Vrije Universiteit Brussels. I have a, maybe you have, my question is for, uh, f first question is for Chantal. And uh, basically, you know, like, could you say something about your experience with promoting, you know, like interoperability in the social media space, you know, in the policy uh, arena? Uh, I have the sense that, like, we ran into pretty significant opposition from, let's say, the broader law enforcement uh, community. And, um, you know, most of that opposition, I think, wasn't necessarily public, but, you know, it was of the form, like, we prefer actually just a bunch of centralized platforms because they're much more effective in establishing relationships with and making sure that certain kind of harmful stuff and illegal content is being addressed. And, and, and generally kind of is a better situation for law enforcement and government to have leverage over social media spaces. Of course, we also ran into that kind of being voiced quite publicly by, uh, by Francis Hogan. You know, said like, oh, the interoperability is like the worst you can think about, you know, that's spreading the problems. And um, so it's like that is uh, that's quite a significant opposition that exists in the in the social media interoperability space. And I'm, I'm just curious where you where you feel that we, we, we landed and now that the DSA has been concluded. And maybe then a question for the whole panel. You know, like, so one of the things about the interoperability and let's say Article 7 of the DMA, which says the interoperability requirement or the possibility of interoperability for the uh, messaging services, it takes actually a lot of work to do this in practice. You know, like you need to work on like the implementation. It's, 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 it's really labor intensive, both on the in industry and the service side, on the technical side, but also for policy makers. And, and I, I don't have the sense that uh, it's a pr big priority for the European Commission. There's a, like just an enormous task in, in starting to enforce uh, the DMA. And I don't think this is very high on the list, but what are the, what are the ways in which th this can be made into a higher uh, priority for the, for the Commission? What, what are your thoughts on like pushing the Commission and, um, and people here in Brussels to take this more seriously in the implementation? I can, uh, yeah, maybe start. Thanks for the question. It's a great question. Um, so on the one hand, yes, um, as you say precisely, law enforcement um, is very keen on having to deal all around the world. Um, so <laughs> UK, uh, Turkey, Tunisia, wherever, they are very um, keen of having to deal with only uh, quite few players and being able, because that will facil facilitate um, them being able to control or or have, as you say, direct relationships, um, and in that and this is basically one of the reasons which confirms why we want uh, more decentralization, because we do not want um, because it is also one of the means to basically limit uh, government control on user speech because they will have many more actors that they will have to deal with. Um, same with the requirements to host um, data um, physically as well in the country. Um, so we have definitely encountered opposition from law enforcement, of course, also from uh, the biggest companies who are not particularly keen um, to get um, to get that uh, competition. And and also we need we need to clarify when it comes to uh, sometimes the narrative is also a bit um, that we are inviting any sort of rogue actors to come in. Um, that might be even less um, human rights compliance in their policies and and the way. And, and, and their activities and the way they conduct their business then say meta. But of course, um, and also maybe to respond a bit to, to Jan's point, we don't say interoperability is the only solution. It needs to go hand in hand, of course, with, with respect for, for human rights standards. Uh, the collection of data as is done today is a clear infringement of the right to privacy. So these are uh, complementary measures. Um, and in that sense, um, we, we, we do think that if, if the human rights standards are clear for the new players as well, um, and for the current ones, that uh, again this will this will be uh, beneficial overall. And we do think that we have been able, particularly with the Digital Markets Act, uh, as I mentioned at the start, to bring in this human rights component to to the competition debate. So again, it didn't go as far as we wanted to, but we do see it very much as a start 
of a sort of anti-monopoly movement that is connected with a strong human rights movement, um, with civil society being at the table when it's about the enforcement of the DMA, and very much so as well with the DSA, of course, because also the DSA puts uh, human rights uh, lists as one of its core objectives. It has uh, a lot of mention to fundamental rights and civil society organizations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes, there is strong opposition, but we do think um, things in certain uh, spaces and in the European Union are going in the right direction, and this is something that we can continue to build on. And can I also invite uh, all the panelists to reflect on, on uh, the second part of Yuri's question when it comes to how can uh, we, how, how can the European Com uh, Commission um, put this uh, more at the forefront in terms of uh, next policy objectives when there's so much concern about uh, enforcement of the DSA and DMA? And um, Vittorio, yeah. let's start with you. Well, yeah, before coming to that, I, I'd like to just mentioned that my perception early last year this was was that the uh, interoperability of social media was blocked uh, not mm, too much because of law enforcement proper let's say uh, concerns but because of uh, national security concerns and political concerns on like uh, basically to say they say this bluntly and don't quote me how are we gonna take down russian propaganda if uh, rather than just having to deal with facebook we, we have to deal with like, like uh, 1000 different systems so that, that because i mean that, that especially last year this was yeah the top concern but i mean coming to implementation yeah well yeah, we we have to create demand so we have to show that there are people out there that want to build uh, interoperable instant messaging applications or uh, all the others and are just waiting for the gatekeepers to open up the interfaces and this is a, a task for the free software community and well we actually have them because in the end we have matrix i think most of us are also already using matrix and the, the people from matrix from airment are actually very active in this discussion so uh, but, but i mean the, the, that's the really what, what you have i mean we have to show that there are people waiting for these people and companies because as we said I mean, if uh, it's important for digital rights activists uh, to stand up, but there are parts of the European Parliament that, that maybe say, okay, you know, it's the usual activists. And if businesses started to say, we, we, European businesses, we, we do this, uh, we want this, then they start to list more. It's unfortunate, but that's how it is. And this is why companies like, I mean, all the European open source software industry is starting to become active and we've been doing things uh, around this. And, uh, Technically, it's not so complex. I mean, there, there are, by the way, standardization efforts uh, going on, starting at the IETF. And uh, I mean, the, there's um, the, it's really more of a matter of convincing the gatekeepers not to do too much resistance, and we we don't know how it will be. But from the Commission's viewpoint, the, the problem is that they they feel this is hard because they it's a new problem and they don't have the skills. I'd say in the sense that. Uh, that they have people that are very competent at regulation and at antitrust, and that, but they don't have technical experts, in, at least in the standing, not enough and not of the right type in the, in the staff. So the problem is how can we build something which is sort of a mixed effort between the Commission and the community, the, I mean, everybody in Europe that cares about this, so that we can maybe provide them with the technical and practical expertise on what they should be asking the gatekeepers to do. And then, of course, we'll see whether they list them. Thank you. Ian, do you want to go next on this question? Uh, Ian, can we hear from you? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, in a way, people need to realize that uh, when it comes to privacy, privacy is also a security matter. And I think, in a way, uh, a lot of the issues that we're dealing with, misinformation and the like, would not be there if it wasn't for the recommendation engines, right? So again, it's tied to the fact, uh, and, uh, which is why, I mean, you, you look at someone, uh, I mean, Facebook has been talking about how many people they have working on dealing with uh, misinformation and the like. So basically you create uh, a system that propagates misinformation, and then you hire a lot of people to deal with it. Now it's a lot easier if you look at the kind of how things worked in the old days. If you had a crazy person saying something silly somewhere on the internet, you wouldn't know because you would never see it. Now the algorithms now take that information and push it to the forefront. So we need to basically uh, understand that, uh, again, the algorithms are part of the problem. Distributed systems are better. Uh, I, I think from a privacy perspective, also from the perspective of, of dealing with uh, 
uh, all, all how the how the flow of information is going. Anyone that's playing with the new technologies, I mean, there's a lot of focus on the on the messaging apps now. I think in some ways the social network apps are even I mean more interesting in 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 a way because again the algorithms deciding the content that you're seeing and the like are part of that equation to a greater extent. And, and, and I really think that, again, those algorithms are a, a very big part of the problem. So I think people have been thinking that, okay, we need to give up privacy for the sake of security. I would like to go in the other direction and saying our lack of privacy is, is a significant security problem and we need to resolve that. And that's also why, I mean, I'm, I'm all for interoperability, just not if it's cementing the, the, the sharing of data uh, about what we are and who we are. And, uh, I mean, th th that's where it becomes of a problem, right? Thank you. We have uh, one more question in the room, and uh, I'd like the panelists, when they answer that question, to also build in their final remarks as we're coming close to the end of the session. And I hope our predictions uh, judge did not forget to monitor Mastodon and Twitter, because we have uh, three little awards to, uh, to hand on. Um, so please. Uh, thank you. You will be really glad I don't have a question. I just have a comment. So uh, if that's okay. So my name is Duan from a small privacy watchdog organization based in Croatia. I just have a comment on the narrative of the promise of third party recommendation uh, systems and what it can bring. So e even in this panel, I see that uh, uh, most of the line of thinking is uh, connected to, you know, uh, quality of the public debate and misinformation. Uh, but Francis uh, Huygen uh, testified that basically most of the things that we see as negative in social networks would just melt away if we dealt with the uh, engagement-based uh, ranking. So in, in a sense, this uh, ranking system is behind, you know, massacres in, in Myanmar, uh, the civil wars in Africa, uh, teen uh, eating disorders uh, uh, on uh, Instagram. Uh, so, uh, basically, I would just suggest sort of um, painting a more broad picture of this promise of new recommendation systems and m maybe framing it as uh, well-being of the society and even the individual. And I would opt for this, especially in line of the growing, uh, scientific, uh, growing body of scientific work that directly links uh, this pandemic of mental health issues among the young with the use of uh, social media. So in a sense, this would not just safeguard uh, the public debate, it would also safeguard the well-being of a society and individuals and especially the uh, young kids who have like uh, increasing, uh, increasing uh, rates of uh, mental disorders which are continuing uh, even today. So that's just a small comment. Thank you, thank you for... A question in the back, should we take that? Do you have a real question? Uh, if it's quick, then we can take it. Is it quick? And in the meantime, I'd like the panel to, to reflect on one final thought they, they want to share uh, with uh, the audience or with the European Commission if they do have uh, recommendations for how to implement interoperability um, in the 2024 mandate. Um, and one more thing that I also forgot, but let us, let's let's hear the question first. Yeah, I, I hope it doesn't broaden the scope too much. But we've talked a lot about uh, like messaging apps and the fact that uh, and uh, and praise the um, the rise of our open standards and uh, operability and and also many in the past have predicted the death of email and yet nobody is using GPG, right? And so I was thinking like in terms of interoperability and also the platform and also about like uh, competition and, um, and uh, the enforcement of privacy laws. Um, what, what is your prediction about emails in the future uh, of uh, privacy laws and platforms? Okay, I, w I would, to be honest, I would go even more radical. I would say like, how can we reimagine the whole architecture of infrastructure? Like maybe separating the infrastructure layer from the uh, user interface layer from the data collection layer. And I think that offers a, a lot more opportunities in, in terms of 
really rethinking how uh, how platforms work. But I know Ian also wrote um, an article, if I'm not mistaken, uh, myth busting what uh, Francis Hogan uh, said about interoperability. So maybe he can bring in that point very quickly. And then uh, one final thought from from our panelists. Um, well, very specifically, and. The, um, what Haugen said to the European Parliament was interpreted at one point as she was against interoperability. That I then talked more to the people who basically had planned her t grand tour of Europe. Um, and what they said was she was talking about the DSA very specifically and not about the DMA and its uh, interoperability uh, obligations. I, I, but bringing it that back to Joris's question, um, I think absolutely there were concerns about in, in the EU Council about disinformation and what interoperable social media would do to attempt to reduce disinformation. I think all those concerns have good answers. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't doubt that what Vittorio said was correct also. I spoke to one of the most senior people in the Council at the time. Um, the DMA was, was being finalized and he, his, his concern was much, much more basic and really I sort of slightly put my head in my hands afterwards. This was a minister uh, who said, I can't imagine what interoperable social media looks like. And I mean, I tried to explain. I mean, what I should have, I, I, I found that baffling given, you know, Mastodon isn't only, you know, six months old. Mastodon, even at the time, had four million user accounts. Um, I mean, it seems pretty straightforward to me, but that, that has been one of the problems in having these conversations with politicians. They're not technical experts, that's fine. Um, but their, their sort of vision of the world seems very constrained by what, what they're familiar with themselves, what tools they use. Clearly, they hadn't used Mastodon. Um, and I think that's one of the positive things about the, the DMA messaging interoperability obligation. It will make a lot more people familiar with the, the idea of interoperability over time, I hope. Uh, I'm, I'm getting uh, very... Um, uh, you know, expansive signs that uh, unfortunately we would need to, to wrap up the session uh, here. Uh, I would like the, to ask the panelists, the, the remaining panelists, if they can uh, still post their answers on Mastodon or, or Twitter so that we don't leave this uh, discussion uh, hanging in the air. Um, and